if you haven't heard this song, you can make out what the lyrics are. It's called Firm Foundation. And things may not always be what they seem, but thank God we have his firm foundation to stand on. Amen. When the thread of darkness has come breaking in And the force of fear blows like a violent wind When confusion strikes and clouds of chaos hit I know that my heart cannot be set on circumstances for my eyes are locked on the God who sees the end. So when the world around me cries out, who can stand? I know that I will not be moved, for my feet are planted in you. I will not be moved, for my feet are planted in you. I will rejoice within the current's rage, singing of, I will not be moved, for my feet are planted in you. I will not be moved, for my feet are planted in you. So appreciate that, Miss Lydia. A firm foundation. You know, none of us come in here on Sunday and sit down on a pew and wonder if that pew is going to hold us up, right? It's a firm foundation. Even Rachel's pew, I believe, is not going to give way today. And Christ is our firm foundation. How appropriate. Join me now, please, in Matthew and the ninth chapter. Matthew chapter 9. And let's consider today the greatest of all miracles. Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse number 1, where it says, He, that's Jesus, entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. That's Capernaum, where he was headquartered at that time. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, 
lying on a bed, and Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. We'll come back to this passage in a moment. We see here early on in Jesus' ministry, his power as he does miracles. And in chapters uh, 8 and 9 of Matthew, he does a number of miracles which show his power and prove that he is God. A series of 10 miracles. And we've already seen some of this. We've seen him cleanse the leper last week and calm a storm. You remember before I preached to you about Jesus casting out demons. And where did he cast those demons into? Into the swine, right? Deviled ham. That's right. Jesus invented it. (laughs) We've seen his power over the physical, his power over the natural, his power over the spiritual. And at the end of this book of Matthew, in Matthew 28 and verse 18, it says, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, What? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power. Say those two words with me, please. All power. He's all powerful. He's omnipotent, our God. We can't possibly fathom or wrap our heads around the power of our God. And he proves it with these miracles. The same God who created the universe. The one who spoke this world into its existence can not only heal the hurting and still the storm, but he can save our souls. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the greatest of all miracles. The saving of a soul, as we saw repeated four times in a few minutes on just one day in this church this week. Jesus, who has power over demons and power over disaster and has power over disease, later on in this chapter 9, we see him actually have power over death. In verses 18 through 25, we see him raise this young lady from the dead. Well, in our text, Jesus has just left the maniac of Gadara, where he cast out a demon. He left the whole region of Gadara. And does anyone remember why Jesus left that area of the country of Gadara? It was because they ran him off. They asked him to leave, or they told him to get out of here. And you know, it's interesting to me that in all of Scripture, there's no record that Jesus ever returned to that region where he did these mighty miracles Well, it's a very dangerous thing to reject Jesus, especially in the face of him proving his deity. It's a very dangerous thing to reject Christ, for you never know when your rejection will be your last. You never know when he may accept that rejection and decide to move on to someone else. You never know when you've rejected him for the last time. And so I implore you today, if you're listening to me in this room or live on recording right now, if he knocks, if Jesus knocks on your heart's door, make sure and answer and invite him in. So Jesus is in Capernaum. It's his ministry headquarters. And there's three things for us to see today. And these are all on the back of your bulletin. If you'd like to follow along, fill in a couple of blanks along the way. Number one. The first thing to see is the pardon, the pardon that happens with this man we just read about. Verse 1 again, or verse 2, Behold, they brought him uh, unto him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed, and Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Read the last few words together with me, please. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Mark 2 gives us more detail of this same story. Tells us who the they are. The they are. Who are they? The ones who bring in this crippled man are actually four men. And the place where Jesus was preaching was so full that they had to 
lower this man in through the roof, Mark clarifies. So they take off the thatching, perhaps in the center at the peak, and lower the man down right to the middle where Jesus would have been standing and preaching to this great crowd. We don't know these four men's names, so I've decided to name them today. I think the first guy could be called Frank Faith. Frank Faith. He says, guys, we got to get this man to Jesus, for I believe, I have faith, I believe that Jesus can heal this man and can give him what he needs. And you know, we will never grow as Christians. We will never grow likewise as a church until we firmly believe that Jesus is the answer. And when we firmly believe that is when we do exactly what Brother Chris did this week and invite them to come. And we do just what that young lady did and invite others to come. And Doc said, novel idea. Maybe we should get back to the basics of Frank Faith who says, I believe if I can just bring this person to Jesus, he has the answer to their problem. We must be absolutely convinced that Jesus is the only answer for sin-sick souls. Are you burdened for the United States of America? Here we are in 2020. What's going on in 2020 besides earthquakes and fires and storms and flooding and stuff like that that we see oftentimes? What else? An election. (laughs) Things hang in the balance right now. Perhaps millions upon millions of unborn hangs in the balance now. What else is in the air? Yeah, a virus is in the air. Put your mask on, Doc. (laughs) There's a virus in the air. What's in the air is sin. And we must be absolutely convinced that Jesus is the answer for the United States of America. We need to be frank faith. The second guy we could call Larry Love. Larry Love, he said, I love this man. I want to bring this man to Jesus because I love him. I care for his soul and I cannot quit. I will not accept anything less than to bring him to Jesus. And so we must fall in love once again with the souls of mankind as someone one day cared for your soul. Everybody here was cared for by somebody. Somebody prayed for you. Somebody cared for your soul. And if you happen to know who that was, Would you just raise your hand all across the room? I know who cared for my soul. You may put your hands down. May we care for sin-sick souls like Larry Love. May we have the faith of Frank to bring him to Jesus. The third guy we can call Dan Determination. He was determined because he said, let's stop talking about it. Let's stop formulating plans. Let's stop uh, preaching about it and let's start doing something. Let's get this show on the road and let's make it happen. I had a pastor early on in my ministry who would give me a tough task to do. And when I told him why it might be tough or why maybe it couldn't be done, he would say this, make the rabbit climb the tree. And I remember the first time he said it, I said, but rabbits don't climb trees. He said, that's why you got to make them. (laughs) Sometimes you just got to make it happen. Now, absolutely, we should pray as if everything depends on God. And certainly without me, you can do nothing as Jesus said. But Dan Determination says, I'm going to do my best to make it happen. And when they arrived and they saw the entrance crowded, he says, no, 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 we're going to find a way. We've come this far. Let's lower him through the roof. But we're going to find a way to bring this person to Jesus. Now, I thank God for people here at First Baptist Church who see a task and do it, who just take initiative. It happened once again this week when Miss Bonnie came out and she just uh, redid the entryway out here. Did you notice the gravel that she put out there and more that she did with the flowers? And over uh, another day of the week, I saw uh, you working out there with uh, the memorial area. Um, Take initiative. Make things happen. We've got to have the attitude of Dan determination. 
Here's the attitude. If we're going to go anywhere as a church, then I need to take personal responsibility to see it through. I want to be a part of the key to the success of my church. And then we come to the fourth guy. See, the the man who was sick had four limbs, and none of them worked. And so these four men each took a limb. And the fourth guy was Carl Cooperation. He said, we're never going to succeed unless we team up and work together. We've all got to be pulling the nets in the same direction as fishers of men. Carl Cooperation said, everyone's got to grab a limb. Well, many people in our lives will never come to Jesus unless they're brought to Jesus. Some here in the room, no doubt, would say, I came to Jesus, maybe through the prayers, maybe through the encouragement of someone. But I'm sure there's some here who would say, I was brought to Jesus. Well, the context here indicates that this man was sick, in his case, because of sin. Not all sickness is because of sin, but he was sick because of personal sin in his life. And here's how we know this, because usually Jesus deals with somebody's physical ailment before he deals with their spiritual malady. Usually he touches them physically before he touches them spiritually. Usually he works on them naturally before he works on them supernaturally. He would heal a person in their body, and then he would show them how they can be healed in their soul. But in this case, he goes straight to the cause of the physical problem, which was spiritual in nature. He said, thy sins be forgiven thee. Why? This man came in faith. Just as Frank Faith and the other three had faith to bring him to Jesus, when he saw their faith, he was talking about this man too, this man who had the faith to allow them to carry him that way to Jesus. He, of all people, wanted to be the one there. When they had the idea of we're going to take you up on the roof and drop you down, that's where some of us say, "Uh, you're going to do what? (laughs) And he wanted to get to Jesus. He had faith. And Jesus said, I've not seen so great a faith. And so, look this way, please. Jesus went straight to the heart of the problem. And what is the heart of the problem? It's the problem of the heart. He went right to the heart of the matter. He went directly to the root, not just the fruit problem. This man needed forgiveness of his sins, and he knew it, and he had faith, and his faith led to God's grace. Man's faith leads to God's grace. It's the path to God's grace. It's how you get there from here. And so I remind you today, folks, our problem is not an outward problem. Our problem is not the visible behavior on the outside. That's the fruit. That's just the symptoms of the real heart problem. The inward condition of sin. And for this reason, jot it down please, we don't need reformation. We need transformation. Transformation. We don't need to turn over a new leaf. We need a whole new tree. You must be born again. Jesus said it first. And so that's only possible by the pardon. That's number one today. The pardon that Jesus offers to us. You know, churches today have a lot of social programs. And I'm not against a social program. We have some social programs that minister, as Jesus did, to physical needs of people. I'm proud of our bread ministry and what it does here to some, for someone physically. And, and then, of course, we know that we need to take it further, right? Because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. They need the bread of the word, he who is the living word. I'm not against social programs, but a lot of churches, that's all they are anymore today, is social programs. And may I say it kindly and clearly this morning, that's just making the world a better place to go to hell from if you don't get to the heart of the matter, which is this matter of the heart, that we're sin sick and that we must be born again. 
Many social programs exist today to help people, but sadly they deal only with the effects of sin, the fruit, the outward. They deal only with the guilt of sin. We need to yank the root. That's what Jesus did right here as he preached to this whole great crowd. Instead of focusing on all those numbers, he saw the faith of one and his eye was attracted to that one. It was so important to Jesus to heal that one. And in his case, it was a spiritual healing. Well, you want your doctor to treat your condition, right? If you've got a condition, if you've got a disease, you'd like for your doctor to treat your disease, not just your symptoms. My mind's reminded of a little boy who was bad. He was bad on this particular day too, and his family had a chalkboard by the phone where they wrote messages, and he got in big trouble. And he went to that chalkboard beside the phone and for the first time, he wrote down a message. He wrote, Dear Mommy, please forgive me. If so, please rub this out. <laughs> and he was so relieved when he checked the board later and his mother had erased it clean. Folks, here's a wonderful truth. Bring your sins to Jesus. He won't rub them in. He'll rub them out. That's what our Lord does. Pardon is number one. Number two, notice the power with me as we continue in some more verses, starting in verse three. Think of the word power. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore, thank ye evil in your hearts. For whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. Verse six, But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath what? Power, power. Mark clarifies and adds a little more to this story. He says that the scribes said, who can forgive sins but God only? Think of that question. Who can forgive sins except God? That was the scribes' full question. And it was a good question. But they came up with the wrong answer. They were right that only God can forgive sin, but they were wrong in that they didn't believe that Jesus was God. They were implying, you can't forgive sins, only God can do that. That implies, you're not God. Well, you can't become a Christian simply by believing in God. There, I said it. You can't become a Christian just by believing in God. Many believe in God. You must make a decision about Jesus Christ. What you do with Jesus determines what he does with you. Many believe in God. The Bible says in James 2.19, even the devils, the demons, believe in God, but they're by no means saved, of course. We all must make a decision about Jesus Christ. There's no middle ground. We can't be neutral about him. Now I want to point out something else in verse number four. Jesus knowing their thoughts. You see that? Jesus knowing their thoughts. Only God can read our minds. That's why we shouldn't judge one another. Like, I know what you're thinking. I know what your motive is on this. No, you don't. You're not God. They thought they knew his mind. But they were dead wrong about that. And then Jesus turns around and proves that he's God once again by reading their minds. He knew their thoughts. You know, our culture is so naive around us, right? Have you ever been up so late at night that you uh, turn on TV and they got one of these psychics or mind readers on there? Dion Warwitch. <laughs> One of those ones. Our naive culture that is so grasping to believe in something will actually lap that garbage up, right? And you'll see them around towns as you travel around here. Psychics, mind readers, palm readers. You'll pull up to their little shack. Even though their sin says, their sign there out front says, Madam Zonga sees all, knows all, tells all. 
Hulk, so I know you're out here. Yeah, right. We're so naive that we believe in that garbage. Hebrews 4.13 says this, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are what? Naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Only God can read our minds. Now, with that said, we've come to God's house together today. We all come into the house of God carrying our own burdens. But will we admit it to the one who already knows it? We've got sins laden on our shoulders. Whether we're saved or not, we're still sinners, right? We're laden, heavy laden with sin. We come in with these burdens on our shoulders. What will we do inside God's house in these next few moments? Will we confess our sin to the one who says, I promise to be faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you of all of it if we will just confess our sins to him? He wants for us to admit it. He already knows it. He needs for us to name it. That's what confess means, to just say it with our own mouth. So let's do something different today and each time we come to God's house than what we've been doing sometimes. When the invitation comes and is given, just as Jesus in Scripture would give an invitation, we will give one today as well. When the invitation is given, instead of just standing still like a pious, holy hypocrite, like a pompous person, let's do something different and remember that Jesus knows our thoughts. He knows what we've done. He's watching for our reaction to his powerful word. I don't claim to be a powerful preacher, but I know this for certain. No one can preach a more powerful gospel than the one that I preach. It's his. And it will do powerful things. And he's watching for our reaction. He knows what we've done. Who cares who else may be watching? God is watching. He's the one that's watching. Some people say, oh, I, I could never make a public stand in church. There'll be so many people there. Listen, there'll be a lot more people there on Judgment Day in heaven. A lot more people. And they'll be watching. Remember, sometimes God is not the only one that we need to apologize to. If we've offended someone, if we've got a hatchet to bury, then we must do that as well. So, back to our text, verse 5. Jesus says, what's easier to say? Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine own house. Jesus says, okay, you don't believe I just forgave him of his sins? Because you can't see it with your own eyes? You can't see the occurrence of the forgiveness of sin. Let me show you something you can't argue with. Jesus says, watch this. And tells the man, stand up and walk. And it happens. It's a miracle. It looks like a great miracle. But what was the greatest miracle? Thy sins be forgiven thee. That was the greatest miracle. Can I get a witness today? That was the greatest miracle. But man that day would have said, he said some words about forgiveness, but then he started walking. What a miracle! And indeed, what a miracle. But the greatest of all miracles happened to me on September 7th, 1977 in the evening. It was a weekday evening, and it was when I was saved from my sin. And you've got your own testimony as well. It's something you can't argue with, what Jesus did. And some people even to this day say, I would believe, I would believe on Christ if I could just see a miracle. If I could just see a miracle, then I would believe that he's God and I would believe on him. Really? Okay. 
here goes. Just take a look around this room. Turn, wherever you're at, turn your heads, let me see them, and look around at one another. At all these miracles. The greatest of all miracles, if you want proof, are sitting around this place right now, joy-filled lives transformed by the power of Christ. Let's talk about this a little more. There's many things in the Bible that you can argue about if you like. But you can't argue with a changed life. There was another little girl. She'd been praying for her father to get saved. She'd been praying for, it seemed like a long time at her age, for her dad to get saved. And finally, he did get saved. What did the little girl do as a result of her dad finally getting saved? She went around telling everyone, my daddy got saved, my daddy got saved. God answered my prayer, my daddy got saved. The town atheist heard her saying this, approached her and said, honey, let me help you with something. That stuff is a bunch of lies. It's just a fairy tale what you heard. There's no such thing as being saved. And she looked up at that atheist and said, Sir, I don't think it's a fairy tale. But if it is, please, please don't tell my daddy. Because since my daddy got saved, he stopped coming home drunk. Since my daddy got saved, he stopped hitting mommy. Since my daddy got saved, he stopped spending all the money on other things. I don't ever have to hide in the closet anymore in my house since my daddy got saved. And so if it is a fairy tale, please, mister, please don't tell my daddy. You can't argue with a changed life. The psalmist put it this way. Remember the pit. Remember the pit from whence thou came. The pit was the pit of sin from before you were saved. Now since we're being transparent today, raise your hand if you say, I remember the pit. How many here were a bad dude? before you got saved. How many ladies would say, I was a sinner. I remember the pit. And we don't have to belabor our sins and drag them out of the closet, but there's ladies who've done some things and it was before you were saved. And I want to remind you today that when the devil reminds you of those things, you remind him that those things are under the blood. Even though as a human, we will always... Remember the pit from whence we came. Sir, whatever you did, it's as far as the east is from the west. Who else would admit today, if I wasn't saved, my life would be a wreck today if I was alive at all? Right? How many of you think... I have no reason to believe I'd be alive today if I wasn't saved. Let's see those hands. I'd probably be dead if I wasn't saved. So many of us. I know that I'm one of those. I look around this room and I know one thing for certain. There are liars who've been made truthful by the blood of Jesus Christ. There are... impure people who've been made pure. There's drunks who've been made sober. There's promiscuous who have been made faithful. There's selfish people, once selfish people, made generous. There's self-centered people who've been turned into servants. There's drug addicts who are now Jesus addicts. We may not be all that we ought to be, but praise God, we're not what we used to be. Amen. We're not what we used to be. Now, how do you explain that? I'll tell you how. Because there's a miracle in every pew. One in me. One in you. We're all living proof 
There's nothing God can't do. There's a miracle in every pew. If we had time this morning, we could go around the room and each one tell about their miracle. But let's suffice it to this illustration to do this. If you know that God has done a miracle in your life, stand to your feet right now. I know that He's a miracle working God because He's done miracles in me. While you're standing, let me tell you about Charles Bradlaugh. Charles Bradlaugh was an atheist in England. Down in the slums, he ministered uh, another man named Hugh Price Hughes. So we've got on the left side of the screen this atheist. Everybody knew he was an atheist. And on the right side of the screen, Hugh Price Hughes, who ministered in the slums uh, of London. Everyone around London was aware of the miracles of grace that were accomplished at Hughes' mission. Everyone had heard about it. But Bradlaugh, the atheist, challenged him. Challenged Pastor Hughes to a debate. A debate on the very validity of Christianity. And so his challenge to this debate perked up the ears of everyone. All of London was looking. What would Hughes do? Well, first of all, Hughes accepted the challenge of the debate. On one condition, he gave a challenge of his own. He said, I propose that we each bring some concrete evidence to our belief in the form of men and women who've been redeemed from lives of sin and shame by the influence of our teaching. He said, I'll bring a hundred. Let's just keep it down to a hundred people. I'll bring a hundred such men and women, and I challenge you to do the same. And, and by the way, Mr. Bradlaugh, if you can't find a hundred, I'll be satisfied if you just bring 50 people who could stand up and publicly testify that they've been lifted from the pit, lifted from lives of sin and shame by the influence of your teachings. And if you can't bring 50, then just bring 20, okay? 20 is enough. I'll still bring my hundred. But 20 people who say, I have great joy in life because of that man's atheistic teachings. He said, if you can't bring 20, bring 10. No, Mr. Bradlaugh, I challenge you, just bring one. Just bring one person, man or woman, who would give such a testimony to your atheism. And Bradlaugh withdrew the challenge. We've seen the pardon, and we've seen the power. We've all experienced it personally, just like this man in our text. The praise is in verse 8, and I'll just read it to you right now. Verse 8, But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. You know, when you look at the pardon of Jesus, and you examine the power of Jesus Christ and all that's been miraculously accomplished in our lives, it ought to lead us all to praise. Now, I know we all have problems. Churches have problems because they're full of people, imperfect people. Don't allow the problems which arise to obscure your vision from what God is truly doing in your life, in your home, in your family, in the house of God at First Baptist Church of New London, Ohio. Don't allow anything to obscure your vision of these things. If there's anybody who ought to be excited right now, even though it's 2020 with all these things going on, it's the people of First Baptist Church. Blessed people, and we are blessed to be among you. Let's bow our heads for prayer right now. Let's have the attitude of gratitude. Let's praise the name of Jesus. We're all standing where we're at right now. Right where you stand, you've already stood because you said, I've, had, I've experienced a miracle. How many believers in the house right now would add your hand? You'd raise your hand and say, I need a miracle. I'm already saved. But God knows a miracle that I need in my life right now. Can I see your hands all across the room? I promise to pray for you as best as I can. I'm taking it in now. Pray for me, Pastor. 
I need a miracle, you may put your hands down. Don't you know the United States needs a miracle? If my people, God said it first, which are called by my name, that's Christians, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Let's be honest about our sin. Let's turn from our sin. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and will heal their land. What's our land? It's the United States of America. Let's pray for our country. Let's pray for our families. Let's pray for the lost after this prayer. Lord, I want to thank you for each one who's admitted today, I'm a sinner, but I'm a sinner saved by grace. And I need a miracle. Lord, as we get on our knees now before you, it's to praise you for that pardon that you've granted to us, for that power that you've imparted to us, a miracle in every pew. Help us now to be people of praise and to go out of this place doing what a little girl did just this week, wanting to tell others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the music begins to play, our eyes are closed.